Thanks, Conrad. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about Euclid, but uh, Henk and Rene have set the scene uh, extremely well. So I'm going to what I will actually talk about uh, is getting information from data. So the context will be largely weak lensing from from Euclid, but uh, what I will say is uh, is actually very general. <coughs> So the problem that we have is that we make lots of observations of data. This is the raw information or raw data that we have to work with. And the question is, how do we turn that into knowledge? Um, and there's a couple of broad ways to do this. We can characterize the data in a way that uh, requires relatively few assumptions. Um, and we can also try to learn from it in the context of a model, which may be the Big Bang model or some other favorite theory. And I'll talk about both of those uh, in, the, in, in this talk. <coughs> um, I'm not going to be talking about information in terms of uh, entropy or anything like that, but in as a state of knowledge. So I'm going to take a very Bayesian perspective on this <coughs> and look at uh, what we can learn from, uh, from data. So in this context, it's useful to uh, decide what is the model that we're, the framework that we're working in. Um, what are the parameters of the model that we're trying to infer, and what's the data that we're uh, that we're working with? And the goal is basically this object, um, which is the the posterior. So, given the data that we have, then what is the probability distribution for the parameters of the model? And one could extend that to do model comparison and ask uh, what is the probability of the model, Big Bang versus something else, for example. And I'll use this as a shorthand for what one really uh, uh, does in practice, which is uh, to work out the, the try to work out the posterior probability of the parameters given the data that you've just collected and any prior information, which I'll uh, uh, just mark by by the letter I here. Um, so I will be implicit in everything that uh, that I write down. <coughs> so the probability of the model parameters given the data, and that in a sense is really what the scientific method is trying to uh, is, is that's the goal of the scientific method. Uh, from a Bayesian perspective, that's, uh, that's uh, what, what you want. So let's just uh, think a little bit about the model, the data, and the parameters uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, the model that I shall assume is, is the Big Bang. Um, the parameters, you've heard them before, amount of dark matter, ordinary matter, uh, and so on. Um, so let's have a look at the data. Uh, I'll talk about three types of data coming from different periods of the, of the universe. Uh, the CMB, because this is a very useful uh, example to show what the challenges are for doing the science that Euclid will be doing with the galaxy distribution and with the distortions due to, uh, to weak lensing. So let's just have a look at the, at the probabilities uh, to start with. Um, <coughs> the posterior, using Bayes' theorem, can be written in terms of the uh, the likelihood, the probability of getting the data given the parameters, uh, times a prior on the on the parameters, and then divided by the evidence, which for parameter inference is just a normalizing constant and not uh, not important. <coughs> so, in very simple cases, then the prob the posterior, which is what you're after, is uh, just proportional to the likelihood. If, for simplicity, we assume that the the priors are uniform. Um, in more complicated cases, that may not be that may, may not hold. <coughs> so the likelihood is the probability of getting the data uh, given the, uh, the model parameters, so P of D uh, given theta. And the challenge, which is really a theme of, the, of my talk, is that uh, these probability distributions are typically very high dimensional things, and that gives us enormous challenges. Uh, the size of the data well, you heard about the numbers uh, from Rene and Henk of uh, the, the, the size of the data sets that, uh, that uh, Euclid will, will start with. Uh, and basically, it's, in, it's essentially impossible to write down this probability for, uh, for the raw data. So let's have a look at the CMB and see how this is done in the CMB. And it's done very well in the CMB. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons is that uh, we actually know quite a lot about the probability distribution. Uh, this is essentially 
uh, indistinguishable from a Gaussian random field from the quantum fluctuations in the early universe, which means that we know what this probability distribution is for the, for the CMB data to, uh, uh, to, to very high uh, accuracy. It's basically a large multivariate Gaussian distribution. Uh, and that leads to enormous simplifications in the, in the analysis. And I'm going to simplify things uh, still further. There's a lot of uh, things that need to be very carefully taken care of in, in doing this sort of analysis, and they, and they have been done. But at root, this is a field whose statistical properties we know. And one of the reasons of the success of the CMB in uh, telling us about the universe is, is that, that we, we know what the statistical properties are. Uh, there are other reasons why it's very successful as well, but that's one of the main ones. Um, so the only things that you need to know for a Gaussian random field are what's, what is the mean and what is the covariance matrix. Uh, so the mean comes from, uh, uh, well, it depends what your data vector is, but if it's the, uh, if it's the temperature fluctuations, the mean is, is, is zero. Uh, and uh, so all of the information comes from the covariance matrix. So for the CMB, um, for a Gaussian random field, all of the statistical properties are in the two-point function, either the correlation function or its harmonic transform, uh, the power spectrum, which is what's shown here. Uh, and uh, so here's the, the, the famous power spectrum uh, with the best-fitting lambda CDM uh, theoretical model going uh, nicely through the data, apart from the occasional glitch. Um, so if we look at this from a videos work yeah okay so if we if we look at the, uh, the the sequence of events that leads you to the power spectrum and indeed to the inference of the of the uh, cosmological parameters uh, then the starting point is that is time ordered data so the spinning uh, satellite uh, collects data over time gives you a time series of you can't read the numbers here but this is uh, uh, about 10 to the 12 items of data uh, in the time stream and those are then uh, converted into a map, uh, so the map is, uh, is essentially static and the, uh, the time series visits different patches on the sky many, many times. Uh, so you can go from this step to this step in a, a lossless way where you create the temperature fluctuation map of round about 10 to the 8 pixels, slightly fewer. Uh, but you can also do a much more radical data compression from this map down to the power spectrum of round about 10 to the 3 items of data. Um, and uh, because it's a Gaussian random field, then this thing contains uh, essentially all of the information that's in the map, which contains in, in a lossless way all of the information that's in the time order data. And you can then use that, this is not the way that it's done, and I'm simplifying just to uh, make the point, that you can then go from there to the of order 10 cosmological parameters which are inferred from the, uh, from the data. Now, if we want to uh, address the, some of the science goals that, that Henk told us about, then the CMB contains limited information about dark energy and about modified gravity. So we need to look at late-time physics, where the situation is much more complicated. Uh, so the galaxy distribution and the weak lensing distortion patterns uh, are not Gaussian random fields, and uh, that gives us a lot of, um, uh, well, in principle, a lot of grief. So. Um, I maybe won't need to go over this because uh, Hank's already covered it, but the, 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 the reason for using weak lensing is the sensitivity to the growth rate and the geometry of the universe, and these things can tell you about the, uh, the gravity model and the dark energy properties. Um, so let me go on to discuss how <coughs> this sort of data is normally uh, a addressed, and usually it's through some summary statistics. So either the power spectrum for the CMB or here the correlation function of galaxies that Rene's already shown you. Um, so the excess probability of galaxies being at, uh, uh, pairs of galaxies being at separations uh, given by the, uh, the x-axis. Uh, for lensing, this is from the uh, kids survey, I think. The, yeah, the, um, these are, uh, the, this is the power spectrum of the lensing distortion pattern. Uh, so the whole map, the whole original data has been compressed into a number of summary statistics with error bars. And um, that's, uh, that's fine, but there are some questions that one might ask about uh, using summary statistics. One is, um, 
is all of the information in those summary statistics in the CMV. That's uh, pretty much the case. Uh, for these fields, uh, not so much. So for galaxy clustering, for example, you can look at the information content uh, as a function of uh, wave number, so smaller scales on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, because the field has grown by, by gravitational instability, then the two-point function no longer contains all of the information. And the asymmetries that you see in the large voids and small clusters uh, contain information that's, that's not captured fully by the, by the two-point function. And if you look at the information content as a function of scale, uh, then on large scales, uh, the two-point function really does contain most of the information that's available on the large scales. But on smaller scales, uh, you fall short. And this information has been moved into the three-point, the four-point, and the higher-order functions. So if you look only at summary statistics that look at the two-point function, then uh, you, you, don't get, uh, you don't get all of the information. So what's the other issue about, about it? One is that um, if you... If you look at, uh, if you assume that the, um, well, the other, the other point about the, the, the summary statistics is that they may well be correlated. And uh, the correlation function, uh, the, the covariance of the summary statistics may not be known. Uh, it is for a Gaussian field, but for these, uh, not so much. So you have to have some way to, to, to get at that. Uh, and that may be done by simulation. Uh, and that also provides some challenges because if you have a data vector of a certain length, then you need a minimum number of simulations to uh, estimate the covariance properties of the summary statistics. Um, so if you have P summary statistics, you need at least P plus two simulations. And for Euclid, the number of summary statistics that one would want to work with uh, is relatively large. It might be up to about 10,000. Uh, so that gives you very major challenges in uh, 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 even calculating what the, um, uh, what the covariance properties of the objects that you're, you're using uh, are. Um, worse than that is that the covariance properties probably change as the cosmological parameters change, and then it becomes prohibitively expensive to run enough simulations to uh, to estimate the covariance properties of the, of the summary statistics. So an obvious solution is to reduce the size of the data vector, so reduce the number of, uh, uh, of summary statistics that you use, and I'll come back to that later. I think uh, more insidious is that uh, the likelihood function, so the, the probability distribution of the summary statistics uh, themselves, uh, is also not necessarily known. Um, so it's usual to assume that the summary statistics have a joint Gaussian distribution, a multivariate Gaussian distribution, um, and in which case all you need to know is, is the covariance matrix and the, and the mean. Um, but that may not be the case. And uh, here's an example using simulated weak lensing data um, where if you do a hand wave and say, well, probably the central limit theorem means that these statistics are uh, Gaussian distributed, uh, they turn out not to be, probably principally because they're not, they don't satisfy the requirements of the, uh, of the central limit theorem. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what these statistics are, but uh, my colleague Eleanor Selenty uh, looked at the non-Gaussianity in some of these uh, two-point statistics for simulated CFHD lens, weak, lens, uh, weak lensing data. And uh, if these were really Gaussian distributed, then uh, this statistic should look like a blank screen. And in fact, it's not. There's a lot of structure in here. So they're not Gaussian distributed. What influence that has on the final outcome is, uh, is another question, and that's really not, uh, not known. So the question is, does it matter? Uh, we don't actually know but uh, I think we, we know that at some level these are, not, uh, these are not Gaussian distributed. So the question is then what to do with this non-Gaussian data that we, we, we uh, receive from the low redshift universe. Um, it's a very challenging problem in principle uh, because of the very high dimensionality of the, uh, of the probability distributions that you're working with. So the probability for... Uh, the, the data given the, given the model is, uh, is, is, is a very high dimensional, say 10,000 dimensional, uh, dimensional space. 
So one way to handle that is to try to work with lower dimensionality uh, probability distributions by using data compression. So data compression is very easy. Uh, one way to do it is to take all of the lovely data that Rene will give you and then throw away 99.9% .9 of it and then just work with a small proportion of it. You could do that. Um, but the trouble is that obviously if you don't do it in a very careful and controlled way, then you lose information by throwing away the data. Uh, so the goal of doing data compression uh, in a smart way is to try to uh, work with sufficient statistics, if possible, which are statistics that uh, have the same probability distribution uh, whether you use the full data set or whether you use the compressed data set. So if you could do that, then you could get as much information out of the compressed data as from the original data. Uh, in some circumstances, you can do that, but in general, uh, you can't. Um, so a more modest goal is to say, let's not try to design statistics that have exactly the same full probability distributions, but let's uh, at least try to find statistics where the Fisher matrix is the same, which tells you essentially the width of the distributions along the, uh, in the various uh, direction, parameter directions near the peak of the likelihood, assuming it's a unimodal thing. Uh, and that is something that you can do. Um, and uh, we did this for a completely different purposes uh, many years ago with a, uh, an algorithm called MOPED, um, which <coughs> massively reduces the size of the data set uh, without changing the Fisher matrix. Um, so it's a linear compression method where you take the original data and uh, you essentially take the scalar product with a set of, uh, of vectors, uh, MOPED vectors. So it has some similarities with PCA in that regard. Um, and the vectors are given by, uh, by these expressions here. But the remarkable thing about this is that given certain assumptions, then the Fisher matrix for these compressed data uh, is the same as the Fisher matrix for the original data set. So you can start with a data set of size 100 million, say, if your model has only 10 parameters, then you end up with only 10 of these numbers, but those 10 numbers uh, in, in this Fisher matrix sense contain as much information as the, uh, as the original data set. Um, so it's quite remarkable, it's remarkably powerful. And uh, in the light of the challenges that are coming up with Euclid and with LSST, then this data compression is, uh, uh, is, has a new lease of life as a, as a way to handle some of the, uh, some of the challenges. Um, so this solves the simulations problem uh, because the size of the data set P has been reduced to something which is manageable. And uh, if you look just at the, uh, the, the, the number of simulations that you might need, then in the worst case, if you do things in a rather uh, naive way, you might require something like a billion simulations to uh, to do the analysis that can be reduced to about a thousand by using this and uh, and a few other tricks. So since we've had some talks from uh, different fields, let me just say that you could also apply this to uh, medical imaging. This hasn't come out very well. Uh, this is half a brain, uh, or half a head. Um, but uh, if you're looking to register uh, images of uh, uh, medical images, then uh, you, you have a data set which is quite large, in this case something like uh, 26 million voxels, um, but you're really just looking for a few numbers that characterize the, uh, the, the, the difference in the uh, positions of the, uh, of the head. So for a rigid body, um, then you need six numbers, uh, three translations uh, and three rotations, I guess. Uh, th those are the numbers that you're looking for, and then you can then superimpose the two heads and do a difference and see if anything has changed. Uh, so here's an example from a different field where you can, uh, uh, you can use uh, massive data compression to speed up the, the registration of images. For other parts of the body, uh, a rigid, well, if, the, if, the body, if a rigid transformation is appropriate, then it's probably too late to do anything about it. So um, for other parts of the body, you, you may want a, a more sophisticated transformation that uh, could require 12 or more um, ob objects. <coughs> so this is an example, just a, a, a toy example to show you 
that with a highly compressed data set, in this case from uh, a data set of size 100, so this is a, a relatively small data set, uh, these are the posteriors for uh, a certain parameterized model, doesn't really matter what it is, and this is what you get from, from MOPED. For various reasons, you may lose a little bit of information, so these credible re regions are a little bit, uh, a little bit larger, but uh, at least it becomes possible to do it. <coughs> so let's have a look at some of the other possibilities for dealing with these um, high-dimensional uh, probability distributions that are required to do the scientific inference. Um, one possibility is to fit numerically uh, run many simulations and you basically learn the sampling distribution which is the probability of getting uh, any uh, particular data set uh, using machine learning so Florent Leclerc who will talk later uh, is, uh, uh, is pushing this as well and, um, and this is something which is feasible in relatively small numbers of dimensions it's being explored at the moment um, I think it's probably impossible to do this in a large number of dimensions, uh, certainly in a 10,000 dimensional space, I think it's essentially, uh, there's, there's no, no chance whatsoever of characterizing the distribution by running uh, simulations. Um, so the solution for this would also, also, or a solution would be to do massive data compression uh, so that you, you, you end up trying to fit a relatively low dimensional space. Uh, in the case of MOPED, that would be a, a space which is of order the uh, uh, number of parameters uh, in, the, in, in the model. Um, so another related idea is to try to get the, try to fit the, uh, the posterior uh, directly from simulations. Um, and this is uh, um, ABC, approximate Bayesian computation. So the naive way to do this would be if you if you have, uh, let's say, one parameter and one item of data, uh, the, if, you, if you try to fit with simulations the joint distribution of these things, so you run many simulations with different values of theta, each of those generates randomly some, uh, some datum, and then you uh, fit the distribution of this. Uh, and then if you keep e everything, all of those simulations that uh, have the data which is close to the observed data, then that can give you the posterior, but it's rather inefficient. Um, and also the question of what, of keeping things that match the data is, is also a question of, well, how, how close does it have to match? It's, you're clearly not going to get exactly the same positions of galaxies, so you need to use some summary statistics and keep everything that uh, has the same, uh, roughly the same statistical properties as the, uh, as the, as the data that's really been collected. <coughs> So one advance over throwing away most of your simulations is to, as I say, to try to ap approximate this joint distribution. And if you can do that, you can then, if you fit it with some kernel density estimation method, say, then you can, uh, uh, if, you, if you want the likelihood function, then for a given theta, you can take a cut in this direction and get the probability of the data given theta. And if you take a vertical cut, then it will give you the, 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 uh, the posterior, so for the given observed data, then the probability of theta given d is, uh, uh, is given uh, vertically. Okay, so those are some <coughs> ideas that uh, are being explored, but let me uh, propose an alternative which is to be much more ambitious and to avoid using summary statistics at all. Um, and this gives you certain advantages, although it's uh, a challenging way to go. So the idea of, um, of, of this is to build a full model of the data that goes all the way from theory to, to what you observe uh, through a thing called a Bayesian hierarchical model. And the advantage of this is that uh, all of the information can be, uh, can be used. You're not uh, restricted to using two-point or any particular statistics. Uh, and these Bayesian hierarchical models are increasingly being used in a number of different areas. This one is uh, a model for supernova 1A uh, light curves. Um, let me describe it for weak lensing, which is the work that uh, we've been doing at, uh, at Imperial. Um, and the description of a, a BHM reflects the fact that in the full data model, there, there's variability at all levels uh, of, the, uh, of the model. 
For example, the power spectrum is specified by theory, but the actual realization that we have in our universe depends on the random fluctuations, so random phases and so on. Uh, so there's a randomness at that stage. Um, there's also randomness in the measurements of the shapes, so they're not measured precisely. Uh, and uh, the also the relationship between the shapes and the distortion shear pattern is also a very noisy uh, relationship. So those are just some of the places where variability comes in. Uh, Henk told you about some of the others. Uh, but they it basically appears at all levels of the, uh, uh, of the problem. But if you split up the problem into these different stages, then you can include uh, many systematic effects, uh, for example, uncertain redshift distributions, uh, selection effects, and so on. Um, and the mask, which can be pretty horrible for lensing, uh, this is very easy to, uh, to include. Anything which is masked out basically has an infinite variance, and you can deal with it very, very easily. And the advantage of this is that, thank you, uh, is that the, uh, the errors are propagated correctly all the way through the, uh, through the process. Uh, and really, this is the only principled way to get to the, the posterior distribution. There's basically no other way to do it properly. And if we can do, so if we can do this, we should. It's the, it's the principal way to do it. So let me just um, sketch out a very simple BHM that gives you perhaps the most uh, important part of the, uh, of the, of the lensing uh, BSM. This is only part of it, but uh, it will show you what the, uh, uh, w uh, how these things work. It, it's worth... Uh, thinking about this uh, carefully because it shows you both how simple it is conceptually and also some of the challenges in implementing it. So if you, just to set the scene, if you were to try to generate uh, synthetically some weak lensing data, uh, you would, given some cosmological parameters, uh, you would uh, draw some cosmological parameters which would give you uh, a power spectrum C. Uh, from the power spectrum, you could generate a map by uh, drawing the harmonic coefficients at random from the power spectrum. That gives you the true shear map, which I've identified by S. And then there's the noise from measurement noise and also from shape noise that needs to be added to that to give you the observed data. Uh, so various probability distributions come into this, and that would be a forward generative model for uh, a, weak lens, a very simple weak lensing simulation. <coughs> so... A reminder that actually what we want to do is, is to go backwards up this tree, that given the data, we want to know what the probability of the, uh, of the cosmological parameters that determine the power spectrum C here. Uh, so one way to do that, or the way to do it in a, in a principled way, is to introduce a lot of so-called latent variables, which are part of the statistical problem, but they're not observed. Uh, and uh, so these would be the true shear values in a pixelated map. So if we introduce those, then the posterior, the probability of the parameters given the data that we observe, we can write that as a, an integral over the unknown true shear map, uh, S here. <coughs> so far, so good. Nobody would disagree, I think, with the, uh, with the maths here. And then we can use Bayes' theorem to express the integrand here of the joint distribution of the map and the parameters uh, as being proportional to the probability of the data given the true map and the parameters times the a prior on the, uh, on the map and the parameters. And this can be simplified because this first term, if this is just measurement noise um, and shape noise, then this is, uh, to a good approximation, not dependent on the cosmological parameters at all um, and may not be uh, at any level. Um, so this first one is just essentially uh, shape noise and measurement noise. Uh, and this second one, second probability, we can uh, decompose into two parts, which is the probability of, given of, the, of the map, given the parameters of the model, uh, times a prior on those parameters. So you, diff you, you split up this uh, basically n uncomputable posterior that we, we can't write down an expression for this uh, it, it, it itself without splitting it up into these, into these parts. Uh, and it splits up nicely into a measurement probability, which you need to know, 
uh, a theory part, uh, which you need to be able to to uh, to simulate or get uh, through some way, and then the uh, the prior that always appears in Bayesian uh, analysis. Um, so it's relatively simple. Uh, the challenge is that uh, you end up writing things in terms of very high dimensional uh, uh, probabilities. Uh, and the, the main problem uh, the main problem is uh, this part here, which is the probability of the, the, the map given the, um, given the parameters. So this is a very high dimensional space. So if you, if you think about pixelizing the sky on a certain scale, then the number of pixels that you may have could be of the order of, uh, uh, of a million or so. And each of those true values of the distortion pattern is a parameter uh, in the model. So one needs to be able to sample from a probability distribution which may have something like a million dimensions in it, almost all of which are the map pixel values, 10 of which are the cosmological parameters and the rest are all uh, pixel values. Uh, so that's very challenging, but there are methods that will do it, uh, principally two, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling and uh, Gibbs sampling, which can uh, sometimes be applied. We use both. We find um, <coughs> HMC is, is a bit more efficient. Um, so let me just show you some examples. How long have I got left? Okay. Uh, so let me show you some examples. Um, if we were to split... The uh, this doesn't, doesn't show very well, but if we sp if, if we split the uh, weekly weekly lensed sources into uh, into two different redshift ranges, and uh, this is simulated data, where we simulate a, a shear map for the two the near and far samples, uh, add some noise, put a very simple mask over the top to mask out some regions, uh, and then draw samples from this map jointly from this map and and the cosmological parameters, or the power spectrum actually in this case. And uh, what you see here is uh, about a thousand of those samples. So these are all possible maps which are consistent with the observed data. And uh, together they characterize the, this very high dimensional, in this case about a hundred thousand dimensional uh, probability dis distribution. Uh, and the variance that you see uh, is over here. So we actually get some information from the masked regions because we're also drawing from the power spectrum, so we know, uh, we know what the, uh, the power spectrum is, uh, give or take, uh, and that constrains the field in the, in the masked regions as well. Uh, this is the same thing again, just bigger. Uh, so you get a lot of things out of this. You get samples of the map, so if you're interested in the mass distribution, then uh, you get a lot of information on the mass distribution. You don't get a single map, you get all possible maps eff effectively that are or many possible maps that are consistent with the data. Uh, but the statistical information for cosmology is in the, is in the power spectra. So this is the so-called E-mode power spectra, which contains the information, um, and it uh, recovers the, the, the true power spectrum well, even, even well below the, uh, the shot noise. Uh, these are for the, 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 the near sample of sources, the far sample, and this is the cross term. I'm running a bit out of time, but you can also characterize the B modes, which shouldn't be there for lensing, or at least should be there at a very low level. So this is a, a good test of systematics remaining in the, uh, in, the, in the sample. You could also look at the EB mode power spectrum, which should be zero for parity reasons. Uh, so if it's not, then again, it may be systematics or it may be some uh, really wacky new physics, which would be exciting. Um, you also get the posteriors uh, which may not be Gaussian. So the, this uh, really shows that for, for these data, if you made a Gaussian assumption for the probability distributions, you'd probably be going uh, fairly, uh, fairly, uh, fairly wrong uh, if, you, if you did that. Um, we've applied this to data as well, to so the CFHT lens survey, just as a proof of concept, where you can get mass maps. These are typical mass maps, I think it's maybe the mean mass maps from the, from the samples, uh, the power spectra, and you can go all the way to parameter infer inference where with just two-bin tomography here, uh, we get the red, uh, the red contours 
and that compares with the uh, the seven bin tomography that uh, uh, is uh, part of the kids analysis. Uh, we use more data per per bin, so the comparison is not uh, is is not uh, particularly uh, significant. And I should say that actually the the goal of this is not to get smaller credible regions. Uh, the goal is to get correct uh, credible regions. That's the uh, that's the aim here. They may end up being being bigger than uh, if you make uh, assumptions about Gaussianity, which uh, which may or may not uh, be good. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, let me just say that I've shown you part of the Bayesian hierarchical model. Uh, what one would like to do is to go all the way from basically from the original CCD pixels to uh, to cosmology. That's probably too much to do, but I think one can build a Bayesian hierarchical model, which is uh, which is feasible and computable, that involves many of the elements of the data model. The bit I've shown you is the bit down the middle here. Uh, there's uh, one could combine the uh, instrumental parts that uh, Henk uh, touched on into, uh, into the model uh, as well. And also on the galaxy side, because the redshifts are only estimated or the probabilities of the redshift distributions are, uh, are inferred uh, separately, that you could include the uncertainties in the redshift distributions in a principled way uh, inside the Bayesian hierarchical model uh, as well. Um, and this is being pursued by uh, Malak Olami and uh, Florent, who's here, but no longer with glasses. So uh, just to finish, so uh, the extent to which these quite uh, sophisticated techniques are going to be required for, for, for Euclid is, uh, uh, is not known. Um, we, don't, we don't know whether uh, using traditional summary statistics is going to be, uh, is going to be good enough. Um, it may be, but the, the danger of having really small statistical errors that if you don't have the accuracy, then you, there's a danger that you, when you see deviations from the theory that you think that's a, 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 a uh, it means you need a new theory, and it may not be. It may be because uh, this part of the analysis uh, is, uh, ne needs to be done in a, uh, a more complicated way. I think with the, with the sort of statistical precision that Euclid gives you, you have to upgrade every single part of the scientific inference uh, process. And Rene talked to you about the, uh, the exquisite hardware that's being built to do it. Uh, Henk talked to you a little bit about the, uh, the, the challenges at the very early stages of the data processing. All of that needs to be, uh, to be kept under really good control. So does the theory predictions. Um, that's also another side of things. Everything has to be, has to be done uh, uh, exquisitely well. And I've concentrated on, on the part really of going from the, uh, the summary data for the sources to the scientific inference, uh, which may also have to be uh, upgraded as well. So let me just uh, summarize by saying that the, the key quantity in all of this is the, is the posterior. That essentially encompasses everything that you've learned from the experiment. Uh, if you've got that, then that's basically it. You've done, you've done the job. Uh, the Gaussian assumption for the, for the data might, might not be good enough. Um, but the challenges that we face are that the probability distributions we need to deal with are extremely high dimensional ones and uh, it's not at all clear that, if you, that you can assume that you know these, the structure of these high dimensional probability distributions uh, for uh, complicated uh, data sets. Um, but you can do something about that by using massive data compression methods um, or if you can do it then uh, using a Bayesian hierarchical model allows you to analyze things from beginning to end in a, in a principled way. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I see a question. Where is the camera? It's here. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. Was, um, I want to um, discuss some of these uh, statistical questions. That, uh, first, I just wanted to sort of say that, 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 that you said in the beginning, and, and I realized that there wasn't much more to say about this, that, that in order that, 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 that Bayes' theorem requires an, an a priori uh, um, distribution, and which you usually don't have, because uh, 
and and um, and you said that therefore you you just uniform distribution. But in a lot of problem, in, in a lot of cases that works. But uh, uh, but there's n there's there's no <laughs> there's there's no guarantee it will. And, and in a lot um, when you don't have an a priori knowledge, you're 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 down to maximum likelihood um, um, estimation, which which in some cases actually works when when the dimensionality of the of the uh, model is, is is low enough, but otherwise it's, it's you get totally meaningless results and I really think this uh, yeah I really think this is where the wisdom of, of the uh, of the scientist comes in is, is that you don't just collect a lot of data and, and analyze it you have a, a uh, direction where you're um, where, where the data is and, and, and of course you're doing this anyway I, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, criticizing or anything but 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 just to keep in mind that 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 it's at that initial experimental stage and and, and deciding how the data is going to be used that the wisdom of the scientist which no computer would have is is uh, is, is important but um I want to talk, ask more specifically um, about the, the, the um, you're saying that a, in a lot of cases the, the distributions are, can, cannot be characterized as um, uh, Gaussian or, or uh, jo jointly Gaussian and um, I find that a little bit surprising because in almost all physical processes where you generate a continuous uh, distribution, a, a continuous random variable, um, there are naturally a number of, of, um, of uh, terms that add to it and the central limiting theorem um, does apply and usually if there's a, um, a if there's a non-Gaussian result, it's a result of a, a, a non-linear um, process that occurs after after the noise has been uh, produced. Say I'm <coughs> I'm sure I'm sure of interest in the transplants. Okay, so you've raised a large number of points. Let me see if I can remember them all. As, as, as far as the prior is concerned, then uh, I absolutely agree with you. A uniform prior is, is, is often not, not the right one to use. I think uh, in the parameter inference problems, then, uh, and particularly with, with data that's as exquisite as Euclid is going to give, then the posterior is going to be dominated by, by the data. So the prior is going to be, uh, I think, not important in the end in, in, this, in this case. But... Uh, in terms of the central limit theorem, I think, uh, so empirically, if you just look at the distributions, um, you can do this with simulations and you find that, you know, even though perhaps one's intuition says, yes, the central limit theorem might apply, very often we, have, we make that argument on the basis of, uh, of uh, uh, data which is not independent and identically distributed. Um, so... Uh, but as I say, you can you can just look empirically and see see if the uh, um, if, if the distributions are Gaussian, and very often in this in these cases they're not. Um, what else do you ask? Well, um, um, could, could you give examples though of how it how it winds up not being Gaussian? Uh, well, one of the w one of the graphs I showed was a statistic which uh, um, showed the uh, for for simulated weak lensing data the distribution of the shear correlation function on different scales for different tomographic bins. And that's one where you are summing up over very large numbers of things, and you might think that that's Gaussian. But if you, uh, the, the my computer's no longer connected, so I can't show you it to you again. But, uh, but there's an example where uh, it's not consistent with the Gaussian distribution. Um, and if I could ask one more thing, um, um, you were talking about um, the compression that, oh, oh, well, well, you call it lossless compression. I think it has a different meaning in the computer industry. Yeah, it's it's you it's get your exact data back, but yeah. but, but, but you were talking about compression where you th where you retain the um, statistical characteristics of the original data uh, in order to use it. Uh, um, and then you you uh, talked about your uh, MLPED um, uh, method, and you threw up a formula on the board that I I don't think anyone could read, but you were saying it was. Um, has some similarities to uh, principal component analysis, in which case <coughs> I assume that, that that formula said that the basis functions are, uh, are are dependent on the data itself. Is that correct? Uh, 
no, no, not at all. No, they don't. I mean, it, 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 it's similar only in that it's a linear matrix operation, but it, in fact, it's a, unlike PCA, where you have a, 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 as many principal components as you have original data, in this case, you only have as many uh, uh, moped vectors, uh, weighting vectors, as you have parameters. So uh, you only have, if you have 10 parameters in your model, you get 10 projections only. Um, so you end up with a, a, a massive data compression uh, over what you started with. And, and you can do that without, without having actually analyzed the, the higher order correlations in the data itself? Uh, yep. Said that the, the the power or the um, the information went into higher order statistics uh, from the power spectrum, um, but is it? But uh, you probably know um, and well, uh, and we're um, sort of sort of simplifying um, the um, often that information was entirely the, the higher order higher key of correlations um, <laughs> so even in a in a log normal field um, you don't get all of the information in the in all of the higher order correlations but so it's, yep. it's important that so it, this is it goes along with your theme that it's important that there are all kinds of observables in large-scale structures but and it's hard to combine everything together <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, you, you've done much more on this than I have, and, uh, but I, uh, I absolutely agree. I was sort of simplifying that yeah, no. you know, some of it goes into the three-point function, but not, it's not necessarily all there. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we need to leave it there. Many thanks for your talk.